Wow, it's great to be here. Um, my first slush, I've heard a lot about slush over the years, and uh, the energy is really great. So thank you, uh, everybody, for organizing this. For, you, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Doran. I'm a partner at TCV, based in London. Uh, TCV is a global investment firm. We've been backing iconic technology companies for the last 27 years. Companies like Spotify, Netflix, Twilio, Salonis, and right here in Finland, uh, Relex. Uh, and I'm, here today, I'm delighted to be here today to talk to another one, uh, Revolut. Um, great to be here with you, Nick. Um, maybe before we start, I'll give you a quick story. I, uh, I first heard about Revolut when I was at home. I was on holiday in Ireland uh, visiting my parents. And I was at this kind of small cafe in the middle of nowhere. And I saw these people using their uh, purple Revolut card. And I asked the cashier, what is this? And she was like, oh, that's, that's the new thing. That's Revolut. Everybody has that. And uh, very quickly after that, I got in touch with Nick, uh, got to know each other pretty well. And uh, you know, here we are today. We're investors in the company and delighted, delighted about that. Maybe as a starting point, um, I just want to say congratulate Nick. Uh, I know people saw the press release today. Uh, 25 million customers. That's pretty amazing. Um, I Remember, I think it was in July, we announced uh, tw 20 million. So that's 5 million customers in four months. And I think it took four years to get to the first um, 5 million. So incredible momentum and clearly accelerating. So congratulations on that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. It's hard to imagine people here don't know what Revolut does or is, but um, it's a pretty tech-savvy crowd. But for those who don't, Nick, do you want to just give a quick background on, on Revolut and what your mission is? Sure. So uh, I started Revolut in 2015, and the initial was my uh, personal problem. So I used to travel a lot, and I, I was expat living in London. So I, I sent money abroad a lot as well. And I was always amazed uh, how much fees I paid to banks um, and to, to exchange currency as well. So initially, I launched Revolut as a, a simple uh, FX card which allowed you to save money when you travel. So you saved uh, about $50 for each $1,000 that you spent. So I started, uh, started the company. We got our first 500 customers, and you know, we raised our first uh, seed round. And at later stages, I encountered similar problems in other financial services. For example, stock trading, crypto trading, uh, insurance, business bank accounts. And slowly, we added uh, all, all these services to, uh, to Revolut. So Revolut is now a digital bank, a super app, how we call it, which, uh, which is live in 39 uh, countries um, with uh, 25 million customers, several hundred thousand uh, business customers, uh, growing very fast, uh, seven years old now. They're pretty staggering numbers, right? You, you mentioned just there, 25 million customers. I think you said 330 million transactions per month. I think there's a thousand businesses in Finland alone now using um, Revolut Business. I think you're adding about 2,000 businesses a week globally. So pretty amazing. Um, can you tell us how you got here? What have been the kind of key lessons? Seven years is an incredibly short time to build such a big business. What are the kind of key things you can talk about? Key lessons? I mean, there are many of them. Uh, the main one is, uh, well, not the main one, but one of, one of the important ones are applicable to every startup or every business is the quality of people that you have. I think, you know, people always talk about quality of people, uh, but it's still so important. I would say it's 90 to 95% importance in success of businesses, quality of people that you have. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, one of the consistencies we see across all the technology companies that we work with, and even in our own organization, is that great people solve, solve problems, right, and kind of can help you build. Um, one of the things that I think differentiates or differentiated Revolut from the first day was that you built a business, or you had the ambition at least to build a business that was international, multi-geo from day one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of doing that? It's not easy. Most, I think most people, if you're giving advice to startups here, would say try to solve you know, the problem you're facing in one country first. Uh, you guys didn't do that. Can you tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, so. When, when I remember all these conversations with, uh, especially VCs, no one believed in the product. And then when I showed the app where you can simultaneously spend money with a card and also send money, everyone was thinking uh, I'm crazy and no one is going to use it because uh, 
for people uh, putting two things together was kind of counterintuitive back then. Uh, and then it took actually a lot of time to raise first seed round because not a single investor believed um, in the product. So that's one thing that I've done, you know, which is counterintuitive. I, I didn't really focus on uh, one product, and then we started with uh, two. And another big thing is, uh, so we started uh, working on launching simultaneously in many countries, UK and Europe. Again, everyone was telling me that, OK, you are too unfocused. You know, you, you'd rather focus on one country, conquer the country, and then you know, move on. I mean, luckily, I didn't do it because um, from infrastructure point of view, uh, to build multi-currency, multi-country, uh, multi-regulation product is, uh, is easier from start. Uh, because if you just do it one country, then you want to expand into second country. You need to change a lot of backend. Um, you need to change uh, regulatory process as well. It's actually uh, um, easier to start a multi-country, multi-product. Easier to go multi-country, multi-product day one. Uh, long term is easier, yes, I do believe. What's been harder, the going multi-country, is it the getting the people, systems, and processes right, or getting the product piece right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, in terms of people and process and product as well, because uh, if you think about countries, uh, every country has uh, its own uh, regulatory regime. So onboarding, uh, slightly different for each country. Transactional monitoring, slightly different. All these uh, nuances uh, regarding uh, compliance, fin crime risk can be you know, quite, quite different. So to build it properly uh, takes time. And uh, you really need to build it uh, in a modularized way when you switch on and off different components. Uh, and uh, as a result, your system can be uh, flexible enough to cover as many countries' regulations as possible. Got it. So it sounds like you, you, you think it's easier to do it day one. So you, you see that competitive mode being multi-country, multi multi-geo, multi sustainable. You're not seeing any, but are you seeing your competitors being able to kind of copy that? Or is this, how sustainable is that mode in your view? Uh, well, if, if you look at uh, history, so I think you know, the most successful banks uh, that achieved it was uh, Citigroup and JP Morgan. I think Citigroup, there were some point in uh, 60 countries plus. Then now they retreated to 40, 30 countries. Uh, reality is very difficult to do. So the way uh, old banks expanded, they simply bought new banks in, uh, in other countries. But as a result, the systems were different. They need to integrate systems. Systems didn't really work with each other. As a result, they had a lot of compliance problems, money laundering problems. And as a result, they gave up. And then they uh, uh, retreated from, from a lot of countries. Uh, our approach is different. We, uh, we build a soft, right? We're not building a bank. And then software should be uh, as modularized and flexible as possible to cover as many regulatory use cases as, uh, as possible. So the result is one system we do not really need to integrate with every new system when we go to a new country. But still, because regulation is so uh, wide, um, it takes time to launch a country. Got it. Um, you've had great success in some countries. I think the penetration in my home country, Ireland, is more than any other bank today after you know, five, six, seven years started. Pretty amazing. I think the UK, also incredible penetration. Why have, you been so, why have you been more successful in some and not in others? And are there countries you're not going to enter because of you know, incumbents or other reasons? I mean, some countries' banks are shittier than in others. I mean, it's as simple as that. But in Ireland, banks are terrible. <laughs> as a result, we, we go 60% market share very fast. Some countries' banks are better, so it takes uh, a slower speed for us. But uh, overall, we're probably top three uh, digital banking provider in every single country in Europe. And then in many, in many countries, we are num number one, uh, such as UK or Ireland. Top three in every country in Europe. Yeah. And that's based on number of users or? Just based on their uh, up any downloads, up any activities. Got it. OK. And where, what are the next kind of, can you give us a preview of the next countries you're going into? It feels like the pace is picking up. Uh, so we are working on launching Latin America, so working on Mexico and Brazil. Uh, we're launching India as well. Uh, we started working on the uh, Philippines. Will it be the same? product there, or are you thinking in some countries you might have a full banking license, you know, full, full offering, other countries you might be more payments oriented, 
How are you thinking about that? Uh, it depends. So it depends what kind of flights we can uh, get quickly. But usually we start with a, with a bank account and PMS product. Uh, once launched, we are adding uh, stock trading, crypto trading, and other products that we have. Got it. Um, we have a lot of founders in the audience who I think uh, are either building B2C and B2B. I think what's unique about Revolut is you have 25 million customers, hundreds of thousands of businesses. So you've kind of gone down the path of building both. What has been the, the, your, different, your experience doing that? Has it been easier on the B2C side or the B2B side? How do you think about the trade-offs? Uh, in terms of product, B2B is definitely much more difficult uh, because uh, there are so many, uh, so many use cases that you need to cover. Uh, plus, complexity of onboarding is business is much, uh, much harder compared to to retail account. Retail account is very simple. Okay, a person takes a selfie, submits documents, uh, but then when you onboard business, there are different corporate structures. Company can be based in multiple countries. Company can own other companies. Uh, so it's it's hard. It's much harder. Got it. Um, I want to shift focus a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of CEOs are focused on these days is leadership. There's a lot of focus on that around. Uh, we've seen, you know, especially what's happened in the um, in the press in recent weeks. Can you talk a little bit about your leadership style? Um, leadership style. Well, le leadership style and how it's grown over the years. Style. Uh, we are very flat. Uh, so I prefer to, to, to have as many direct reports as, uh, as possible. So there's communication uh, feel, uh, flows freely through the company. And then, uh, so the way it works, uh, because I'm already in business for, for, for many years, uh, I managed to uh, create a great team of very capable people who are uh, autonomous and then self-sufficient. So they, they select the right goals themselves and then they execute in order to, to reach these goals themselves. And I'm more like, a, I would say, coach. And because I speak with so many people, sometimes I change uh, their direction a bit to ensure they achieve their goals in the most uh, effective way. So uh, in short, I prefer to be as flat as possible and then to have uh, my direct reports uh, as smart as, as self-sufficient self as possible. Got it. So much surprising for me to hear that, actually. I would have thought you were really, um, in the early days at least, really in the micro. But it sounds like you're empowering your team more. Is that, has that been a change, or has that always been the case? No, I'm still in the micro details, but because my yeah. direct reports, uh, they, they are so good. Uh, my involvement is uh, uh, not as necessary because they know details themselves. But knowing details is super important. A lot of managers, especially coming from big corporate fat jobs, they're just uh, managing uh, being hands-off. Uh, for them, uh, being hands-off means they're not into details. I think uh, being in details is super important because uh, the value of the manager is uh, very simple. They A, need to show direction, and B, change direction uh, if direction is wrong, and also observe quality of execution. If, if you don't know details, then it's impossible to show the right direction, that's number one, and then impossible to evaluate uh, quality of execution as well. So as a result, a manager who doesn't know details is uh, you're simply paying them for nothing. Got it. Um, you've been incredibly successful. What are the kind of two or three traits that you think you admire in yourself that have kind of gotten you here? Uh, I think for entrepreneurs, it's very important to be uh, uh, great problem solvers uh, based on their logic, based on the first principles, not rely on assumptions or on experience, just going, diving to two plus two equals four level, right? If there is some co complex concept that you cannot uh, explain yourself uh, down to the level of 2 plus 2 equals 4, then it means you don't understand something. And I see a lot of people, they just rely on their experience or rely on other people. Uh, but that's uh, not a good approach. I think, you know, for entrepreneurs, it's super important to, to be as deep as possible um, on the binary level, 1 and 0. It's number one. Uh, and number two, I think character is also very important. Uh, being competitive, uh, uh, being uh, driven, uh, being always uh, hungry for success. Because the reality is it's super hard to build a company, and uh, you'll have a lot of uh, failures and a lot of setbacks. So having uh, a character and ability to uh, stand up you know, when, when something happens, um, and uh, having ability to problem solve, um, to, to find the you know, right direction and execute in the right direction is super important. It's a good list. So quantitative, highly quantitative, highly resilient, competitive yeah. problem solver. 
Is it the same for, the team, for your team as well? Is that, are they the traits you look for, or is there other things you look for when you're hiring people? Yeah, we, we, with time, because we obviously hire thousands and thousands of people, I probably interviewed myself about 10,000 people. Uh, so with time, uh, we, we build a pretty robust system how we hire. So obviously, you need to assess skill, the skill set of a person who you hire, whether it's designer, developer, product person. But I think you know, more important is uh, assessing problem solving. So every single person that we hire, they are smart people. And it's super important to hire smart people because things change, uh, industries change. And then if, if, if people don't have this first principle thinking ability, when things change, they're not able to, to catch it. So super smart people is very important. And then uh, secondly, what is important uh, is uh, uh, we call it Barry's interview or high achievers. So we are really looking at the uh, track record of every person that we're interviewing, what they achieved compared to their peer group starting from university. And then the reality is that past performance is uh, a clear indication of future results statistically. So if a person used to be a high achiever in university, then in, in their first job, second job, third job, uh, most likely they will achieve a lot in, uh, in your company as well. So that's, that's another important point. And then on top of it, you obviously interview for, for skills. We've talked a little bit about it around the topic, I guess, just now. And I think there's been a lot of commentary in the press over the years. How would you describe the culture of Revolut today and how, how has that evolved? I know you guys have been very focused on the quantitative side of measuring that, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, culture, I mean, best is described is that we are, we are like a professional uh, sports team, right? So what it means in practice, uh, you are as good as you score. Uh, and then, you know, no one will stay in the team forever because, you know, obviously, you know, there are more people, more competition, uh, more tournaments, and everyone understands it and uh, accepts it. So we're really uh, targeting uh, hiring these uh, uh, elite athletes, right, who, who are prepared to, to work in a competitive environment and who, who want to win, who want to be uh, number one. And obviously, it's a, uh, it's a competitive pressure. And uh, people, uh, to be in the team, they, they accept it. But as a result, uh, being in the team means that you learn from the best really fast. And then you uplift yourself as an individual, which is huge. Plus, on top of it, you know, having uh, such a brand as a Revolut uh, on your CV, plus our training, uh, plus our kind of you know know-how to run a business is super super important for every person. I love the analogy of the professional sports team. Um, you've also got, I think an ownership mentality of Revolut. I, th I think it's well known that every employee has shares in the company. Um, we don't see that every day. Um, I think there's, you know, there's philosophies on both sides uh, of that. What's, what's your view been? Has that been the case since day one? Uh, how, would you recommend that to other startups? Yeah, so, so for, from day one, uh, I have this philosophy of, uh, that everyone should be an ownership of the company. So when we hired people, we gave them sign-up bonuses and shares, and then we also paid uh, uh, like performance bonuses and shares. So what, what I observed with time, especially early days, uh, uh, people didn't really understand the concept of uh, options in the company. But now I think you know, it's more and more common in Europe. But US, uh, from day one, all, all, all people appreciated options. I see we're just running up on time. Um, before we go, what is the most, um, can you share with the audience, I guess, what is the most important thing you're working on at Revolut now, um, and how are you making it happen? I mean, the reality is, uh, no matter how s smart uh, my team is and you know, how, how, how much we believe in any important things, uh, reality is always different. So we, we prefer to, to work in the way when we do new bets. Uh, we, uh, at the moment, we're trying to do like 10, 15 new bets uh, simultaneously. And uh, based on my experience, uh, no matter how I believe in you know, one of them, I'm always wrong. So I just you know, prefer to, to run a portfolio of bets. And hopefully, two, three, five of them will work out. How long do you give a bet before you decide it's working or not? So we have clear timelines. So we, fr from the time when we decided to, to launch a new product to uh, execution is usually 9 to 12 months. Uh, nine, 12 nine months. Nine to 12 months to launch the product. Uh, then in terms of finding a product market fit, it's another six to nine months. If there is no product market fit, we, we, we just stop working on it. Then if there is product market fit, then we need to uh, 
to have at least 10, 20% growth uh, month on month on kind of you know user metrics, gross profit metrics. And then when a, when a new bet reaches, uh, say, $1 million uh, gross profit a month uh, revenue, then uh, we pump more resources into it, and then we hire more people. Uh, and then we have certain KPIs on, on gross profit uh, and revenues that we want to reach year after year. Got it. So you've got incredible processes in place, right? And success so far has been fantastic. If we do a pre-mortem, right? So we're sitting here five years from now, and you've not achieved your ambition for the business, for success that you think is ahead of you. What do you think is well, the reason for that? Uh, well, I, I see it again and again, you know, just company and teams, they're becoming, uh, I would say, settled, right? Not as uh, ambitious, not as aggressive or as before. Slowing down, you know, happy with uh, what they have. And uh, it's always, you know, the beginning of the end, and uh, you see it again and again. And then if you look, for example, at S&P 500 companies, like company on average stays is in the S&P 500 for what, for eight, 10 years, maybe 15 years. And uh, that's, that's reality. I think, you know, one of the most uh, common reasons why uh, a company uh, loses success is just people within becoming too, too settled. So the thing, you know, if we don't achieve what we want to achieve in five years' time, we, 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 yeah, we are the, too settled, yeah. That's the company logo. Maybe to, to round off, um, some advice for founders here. You know, one of the things that I see week to week with you is just the, lev the intensity level never drops, right? It's seven years in. Um, you've been in it for years. You appear as fresh as ever. How do you, how do you manage to do that? How do you, how do you refresh yourself such that you're, you're, you avoid burnout. What advice would you have for founders here on that front? Uh, I think advice is actually uh, you also need to uh, manage your bet properly, right? Because if, if something doesn't work for a long time, you'd rather stop doing it and then switch to something else. Uh, that's super important. I, I see a lot of people who are burnt out, uh, stuck to products that don't work out. For me personally, I mentioned that if, if, a, if a bet doesn't work out, I mean, like stop doing it, you know, find, find something else, else or just you need to be as flexible as possible. Um, uh, this one, and then uh, when you really find something that works out, uh, there is a product market fit, then uh, obviously you need to have a lot of energies uh, to, to execute. And then people have energy from different things. I mean, I personally uh, do a lot of sports. Uh, I try to get out for a week, uh, switch off, go kite surfing, windsurfing, hiking, climbing. Um, so I, uh, I get a lot of energy from kind of you know, sports nature. Uh, some people might prefer you know, other things, but that's, that, that works for me. Great. Is that something maybe when you were first starting the first year or two you had time for? Or did, you, did you make time for that? Or is it something uh, you had You need more time to, for? right? Because uh, otherwise, if you don't do it, your energy goes down and then you're not as sharp uh, and then you make wrong decisions. So you really need to keep your energy very high all the time. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Really appreciate you uh, coming on today. And congrats again on 25 million customers. Incredible milestone. And wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right.